little flashback to A and P1. Remember that there are four types, four basic types of tissues in the body. So I give you one. Connective. Muscle. Muscle. Nervous. Epithelial. Now, three types of muscle tissue. Skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth. And so today, we're going to start talking about skeletal muscle. Now, there are about 700 or so muscles in the human body. In lab, we're only going to learn about 600 pictures. I'm just kidding. It just seems right. I don't think, maybe it's about 50. It's not too bad. But each skeletal muscle, think about your, your biceps brachii. That is essentially an organ. Each skeletal muscle is an organ because it's made out of different tissues. Obviously, there is skeletal muscle tissue in it. There's also connective tissue. There are blood vessels that run through. And there are nerves that run through. In fact, skeletal muscle tissue, one of the characteristics of skeletal muscle tissue is that it will not contract without a signal from a nerve cell, a neuron. Now, cardiac muscle tissue does it need a signal from the nervous system? The nervous system can speed the heart up. It can slow the heart down. But cardiac muscle tissue contracts. It, it stimulates itself to contract. Skeletal muscle tissue is different. The diaphragm. The diaphragm is skeletal muscle. If you damage your cervical spinal cord, the nerve that, that goes to the diaphragm is called the phrenic nerve. That nerve no longer works. The signal to the diaphragm to contract no longer gets there, and you can't breathe. Remember Superman, Christopher Reeve, right? Horse riding accident, broke his neck. They didn't have to keep telling his heart to pump, but they had to put him on a machine that basically made air go in and out of his lungs. Because that muscle, the diaphragm, is, is skeletal muscle. Okay, so if you take any, any skeletal muscle, diaphragm, biceps, brachii, um, the oris, uh, the, yeah, the oris obicularis, oris oculi, any of these muscles, <coughs> they all have basic, the, the same substructure, the, the same organization, the same arrangement. Skeletal muscles are divided into parts called fascicles. Each fascicle contains several muscle fibers. So a muscle is made up of several fascicles. Each fascicle is made up of a bunch of fibers. Now, a muscle fiber is the same thing as a muscle cell. Now, if you remember from A&P1, when you talked about a nerve, you had a nerve, and each nerve was made up of fascicles. And each nerve fascicle was made out of nerve fibers. But in the case of a nerve, a fiber is an axon. It's not the whole nerve cell. It's just the axon, the long part, the output portion of the neuron. Does that make sense? Okay. In the case of skeletal muscles, the fiber is the entire cell, the whole muscle cell. So if you say muscle fiber or muscle cell, you're talking about the same thing. If you say nerve fiber, you're just talking about the axon. Now, just like with nerves, there is connective tissue around each of these structures. The connective tissue around the entire muscle is called the epimycium. Around each fascicle, it's called the perimycium. And around each fiber, it's called the endomycium. So if you take a muscle and you basically look at it, you know, you cut
cut it in half and look at it head on, this is what you're looking at here. The entire muscle, this outer layer of connective tissue, is the epimysium. Each one of these individual structures here is a what? That's a fascicle. And say, all right, so that's a fascicle. So we've taken one of these guys out by itself. The fascicle, the, the connective tissue around the fascicle is the perimysium. And then each one of these structures is a what? Is a fiber, which is the same thing as a cell. Okay. And so if you take one of these guys out by itself, the connective tissue surrounding that is the endomycium. Now, um, Vienna sausages. Kind of Vienna sausages, right? Or Viennese, as they call them, where I went, where I grew up in West Tennessee. We call, I call them Viennese here. Yeah, I, I used to teach in New Orleans, and I said Viennese down there, and they laughed me out of the classroom. Uh, Miss Mellis, do you mean Vienna? Yeah. Sometimes you just don't real, realize how country you are. Viennese. Okay. <laughs> so if you think about that can of Vienna sausages, I'll try to be professional. That can of Vienna sausages. Each little sausage, think about that as a muscle fiber, a muscle cell. Okay? Now, when you open up that can, you got that stuff that's in between the sausages? Okay, that would be the what? Yeah, the endomycete, right? Right? Jelly stuff, you know? Okay, for now it's water because the jelly stuff is like supposed to be bad for you, something like that. You buy the cheap ones, it's still kind of jelly. Now, the whole can with the sausages in it, that whole thing would be the what? Fascicle. So the metal part of the can would represent the perimycin. And if you had like a case of the cans and they were shrink wrapped together, the whole case would be the muscle and the shrink wrap would be the epimycin. Now, tendons. Uh, a little flashback to food. For some reason, I need to food. A lot of my illustrations end up talking about, a lot of my analogies deal with food. Chicken tenders. Everybody knows what a chicken tender is, right? Mm -hmm. buy the chicken tenders. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you go to, like, if you're going to make, like, a chicken alfredo or something, and you go to cut those up, and there's always that stupid white things that you can't, you got to get a knife and cut it off. That's a tendon. You can't just rip that off of there, right? If you rip it off of there, half the chicken tender comes with it. So, a tendon is made out of all of, well, not those, these, <laughs> all of these connective tissue layers. When you're looking at that chicken tender, that little white, silvery white thing, the endomycium that's around every little muscle cell in that chicken tender comes out past the muscle cells, the perimycium around each fascicle comes out, and then the epimycium around the outer, the whole, the, the whole chicken tender, all of those connective tissues continue past the ends of the muscle cells to form the tendons. And that's why you just can't tear, it's not just a surface thing. It's actually connected around each little individual cell and each little individual fascicle in that chicken tender, in that muscle. And that's why you have to take a sharp knife and cut it off. You can't just tear it off. Now, that, these connect, this is the Achilles tendon, by the way, if you didn't know that. That's the Achilles tendon. That's the one that's right back, you know, attached to your heel bone, your uh, calcaneus. But the, the, you remember from AMP1 that all of the bones have an outer covering of connective tissue called the periosteum. And so the, the fibers, the collagen fibers of the tendons are, are woven into the collagen fibers of the periosteum. And those are actually woven into those outer, um, the outer bone layers, the um, lamellae. And so all of this stuff is, is, it's not just, you know, glued on the surface. It's actually interwoven. Now, you have a flat tendon, a real flat, thin tendon. It's called an aponeurosis. So an aponeurosis is just a specialized tendon. Go ahead and put your hand on top of your head and, and move your eyebrows up and down. Can you feel it moving? We'll learn in lab in a week or so that this muscle is called the frontalis and this muscle back here is called the occipitalis. Um, and they're connected to each other by this aponeurosis. So it's just a tendon. Most of the time, tendons attach muscle to bone, but sometimes you have tendons that attach muscle to muscle, particularly in the face. And a lot of times, in the, particularly in the, in, around the head and the face, 
you have tendons that attach muscle to the skin. That's how you get you know, your facial expressions. Because there are bones underneath, so the muscles will originate on the bone, on the skull, on the uh, face bones, facial bones, but then they, they insert actually in the, in the skin. Now, let's talk about skeletal muscle cells. Why do they call them fibers? Normally, every cell has one nucleus, right? Now, red cells, they spit theirs out. Y'all may not know that yet. They started out with a nucleus, but by the time they leave the bone marrow and go into the bloodstream, they lose their nucleus. They spit it out. We'll talk about why later. Skeletal muscle cells, as, as, the, as the, the embryo and the fetus is forming in utero, and the skeletal muscles begin to form, these cells are actually made out of hundreds of immature cells called myoblast. Myo, think muscle. And so what happens is you have hundreds of these individual myoblasts that begin to fuse, and you end up with a great big long multinucleate skeletal muscle cell. And that's why they call them fibers, because they're long. Your um, bicep brachii starts out right up in here somewhere, and it comes down and inserts. But when it contracts, it pulls the forearm up. Well, that's what? I don't know, 12 inches? Each muscle cell, each muscle, muscle fiber in that muscle goes from one end all the way to the other end. So that one cell can be 12 inches long. So that's why they call it a fiber, because it's one big, long, cylindrical cell. And it's made out of hundreds of these myoblasts. When you see the term blast or the, or the suffix blast, think immature cell. If you have a little flashback to um, a one when you're talking about bone cells, remember you had the osteoblasts? that built the bone, they made the bone matrix, and then once they got trapped, they became an osteocyte. They matured. Okay, so that, that blast term means usually a precursor, an earlier form of a cell. So the myoblasts fuse together to become a muscle fiber, a muscle cell. And so every nucleus that they brought with them, each individual cell had its own nucleus, they're all, they all exist inside the big, long muscle fiber. How do I know... I mean, it looks like all this stuff is very similar, right? It's a, it's a tubular structure that's got smaller things inside of it. So how do I know if I'm looking at a diagram? Am I looking at the whole muscle? Am I looking at a fascicle? Or am I looking at just the cell with all these things, which we'll talk about in a minute? <laughs> you know. Look for the nucleus. Wait, there it is. See that? There's the nucleus. If you see the nucleus, and if you see mitochondria, which we'll talk about, where'd they go? Yeah, mitochondria. That's how you know you're inside the cell, if you can see the nucleus and the mitochondria. Up here, see the nucleus? So you know each one of these things is a cell, so this thing must be a fascicle. Okay, so it kind of, give, kind of gives you a landmark, a signpost, to figure out where am I? Am I big or am I looking at something small? If you see blood vessels, you know you're looking at something really big. All right, so we've gone from the muscle, which is surrounded by... Epimycium, okay. Muscles are made out of fascicles, which are surrounded by perimycium. Each fascicle is made out of a bunch of muscle fibers. Each one of the fibers is surrounded by endomycium. Okay, good. Now, just like every other cell, if I draw your generic cell up on the board here, there's a the cell, there's the nucleus. What's that line represent? Yeah, the cell membrane, right? The plasma membrane. Nothing, nothing new. So, the muscle fibers have a plasma membrane. It's called the sarcolemma. But it's just the plasma membrane. So if you're looking at your Vienna sausage, and you're, you're holding it in your hand, and you've washed all that jelly off of it, what you're touching is the sarcolemma, right? And then the endomycium was the stuff that was covering that. All right, now, just like a cell has cytoplasm, the fluid inside a muscle cell is called the sarcoplasm. Okay, now we're going to actually just take a chunk out of this muscle fiber and look at what these red things are on the inside. So, this stuff right here is the what? Sarcolemma. <coughs> Okay, so this is a cell membrane. So we're actually now inside a muscle cell. And there are even more tubular structures 
inside of that. Ah! Okay? So all these little red dots, that's one of these things. Each of those is called a myofibril. So if we go back to our little diagram over here, muscle fibers are made out of myofibrils. Now, each myofibril is surrounded by this stuff that looks like kind of like blue bacon. Sorry. <laughs> That's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Man, that sounds a lot like what? Endoplasmic reticulum. Well, if we were talking about any other cell, we'd call it the endoplasmic reticulum. But in a muscle cell, it's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Well, we'll talk about what the function is of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. I'll give you a little, little clue. In the case of a muscle cell, that's where the calcium ions hang out. Probably says this in 12 slides from now. But the, the, you know, this, in, in a regular cell, the endoplasmic reticulum does a lot of stuff. In a muscle cell, the main function is it's where calcium is stored. Calcium ions are stored. If you remember from AMP1, you started talking about the, the skeletal system and the bones, and 99% of the calcium in our body was stored in our bones, right? You remember there were a couple of hormones that controlled blood calcium levels? Does this sound vaguely familiar to anybody? If the calcium got too high or your calcium levels got too low in the blood, not in the bone, but actually in the body fluids, the calcium ions. Your heart would stop or it would get overexcited. You'd get arrhythmia, tachycardia. So, calcium ions are extremely important for muscle cell and nerve cell function. And the skeletal muscle cells are really, really good at, at having a good supply. They, they hold a lot of calcium ions inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Your cardiac muscle cells, not so much, but we'll talk about that later. These yellow things, it kind of look like little rubber bands around the blue bacon. Those are called the T or transverse tubules. And so if I took my, my uh, marker here and I wrapped some bacon around it and I used some rubber bands to hold the bacon on, <laughs> the rubber bands would be kind of like the T tubules. But notice that the T tubules actually open out. There's little pores here. Little pores, little openings in the sarcolemma. And so the fluid, the extracellular fluid, the fluid that's outside the cell, actually travels through these T-tubules and around all of the myofibrils. It's like if you took a hot dog. You know the little straws that you stir your coffee with? If you took a hot dog and you poked a bunch of those straws through it, they'd be like the T-tubules. And so any water that was in the pan would also be going through those straws, right? If you didn't have the T-tubules, you would only have fluid surrounding the outer surface. But this way, any change in the extracellular fluid is also carried into the interior of the cell. Even though it's not in the cytoplasm of the cell, it's still outside the cytoplasm, but it's, it's tunnels through the cell. Yeah, just think about straws through a hot dog. <laughs> now, action potential. Remember that word from uh, nervous system? Raise my axon and I still need it. Remember that when we were talking about how nerves, or not, not nerves, excuse me, neurons work, nerve cells work, you've got a graded potential here, and if it reached the threshold, if it was strong enough, then you've got an action potential that went all the way down the axon. When a neuron stimulates a muscle cell to contract, it's basically stimulating an action potential in that muscle cell. And that action potential is not only going to just go along the surface, it's going to actually go through those T-tubules. Because a muscle fiber is much thicker than a little skinny axon. That's why you need those T-tubules. If the action potential only went along the surface, the sarcolemma of the muscle cell, then what would happen is these myofibrils on the surface would contract, but the ones in the center of the cell would not. So you want these T-tubules are a way to get that electrical signal, that action potential, around all of those myofibrils. Where the T-tubule comes into contact with the, with the um, sarcoplasmic reticulum, 
Notice that the sarcoplasm reticulum is, has kind of an enlarged area. You've got some kind of a meshwork here, but you've got these little enlarged areas. Those are called the terminal cisterni. So the terminal cisterni are just the kind of swollen edges of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So here's the T-tubule. Here's a terminal cisterna. Here's a terminal cisterna. And you put one T-tubule and two terminal cisterni together and you get a triad. And that's where the calcium is right here. Most of the calcium ions hang out, not here, but right here in those terminal cisterna, right next to the T-tubules. And then, of course, our good old mitochondria. Lots and lots of mitochondria. What's a mitochondria for? ATP. Yeah, ATP. Your muscle cells use a lot of ATP, so they have lots of mitochondria. So we got muscles made out of fascicles, fascicles made out of fibers, fibers made out of myofibrils. All right, so if we take one of the myofibrils, these are cylindr cylindrical structures. Um, you can have hundreds to thousands of these per muscle fiber. You can have really small, think about the muscles that move your eyes. Those are really small muscles. Those muscles may only have um, 100 muscle cells or 50 muscle cells. Maybe they have two fascicles, each one with 25 muscle cells. And each one of those little muscle cells may have, you know, 100 myofibrils inside of that. You can take something like, you know, the JLO muscles, the gluteus maxima, the buttocks. So you may have, you know, a large muscle with, with lots of muscle cells, and those muscle cells are large, each one having a thousand mile fibers. By the way, which brings me to a point. When you, when you exercise and your muscles get more toned, and sometimes, particularly in men because of the testosterone levels, they'll actually get bigger, you don't get any more muscle cells. It's the same number of muscle cells, but the muscle cells get more myofibrils. And so the cells get larger, so the whole muscle gets larger. Does that make sense? Muscle cells don't divide like, you know, um, epithelial tissue and those kind of things. But they can get bigger because they make more of the proteins that these myofibrils are made out of. Okay. So... Just like the muscle cell is, is as long as the muscle, the myofibrils are as long as the muscle cell. And each myofibril is surrounded by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we just keep peeling, it's like peeling an onion, we just keep peeling back more and more layers, we get smaller and smaller. All right, if we take one of the myofibrils, we take one of the myofibrils, so we went from Muscle to fascicle, fascicle to fibers, fibers to myofibrils. Y'all seen the Golden Gate Bridge, right? I mean, not necessarily in person, but <laughs> pictures of it, right? Yeah. It's got these big cables, right, holding, them, holding the, the roadway up. Those cables are made out of individual what? I mean, they're not, they're not a solid piece of steel, are they? They're bundles of what? Wires, yeah, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, so you can think of these myofibrils as a cable that is made out of individual myofilaments, wires. So if we take this one myofibril and we blow that up, you've got some green ones and you've got some pink ones and you've got some purple ones. Okay. Those are called myofilaments. And what these are are basically protein strings or protein strings. <laughs> Protein fibers. Now, they've made these great big words for everything else, but here they got simple. They went thick, <laughs> thin, and I don't know why they didn't just say wiggly. <laughs> now, this is T-I-T-I-N, not like Tennessee Titans. That's A-N. This is T-I-T-I-N. Every time I try to type that word, it tries to change it back to Titan. So if there's a Titan in there, it's supposed to be a tight ten. Okay, so you've got three basic fundamental types of myofilaments. Thick, thin, and squiggly. So you take a bunch of these together, you wrap them up, and you get a myofibril. 
You take a bunch of mild fibrils together and you get a fiber. You put a bunch of fibers together and you get a and you put a bunch of fascicles together and you get a muscle. Alright, the proteins, I said these were protein filaments. The thick filament, the main protein in thick filament is myosin. In fact, sometimes it's called a myosin filament. The thin filament, the main protein is actin. And in this one, the protein is tight. Now, we said there were three types of um, muscle, so muscle tissue, right? We said we're talking about what kind here? Skeletal. And the next one was... And then smooth. The reason smooth is called smooth is because it doesn't have stripes. If you look at skeletal muscle tissue and cardiac muscle tissue, you not kind of see how it's got stripes? Yeah, skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle is what we call striated. It has striations or stripes. Smooth muscle tissue is called smooth because it doesn't have, when you look at it, you don't see the little bands. You don't see the little, the little stripes. Now, we talked about if the muscle goes from here to here, right, like the biceps. We said that the, the muscle went from here to here, the fascicles went from here to here, the fibers went from here to here. The myofibrils go from here to here. But the myofilaments don't go all the way. They're actually broken up in segments. So in other words, you don't have a thick filament that starts here and goes all the way down. You don't have a thin filament that starts here and goes all the way down. They're, they're, not, they're arranged, um, they overlap, but they're not continuous throughout the whole length of the cell. And that's why you get the stripes. If you look here, here's the thick ones. They stop here, right? Or start and stop here. And then there's a gap, and then you've got more. And then there's another gap, and you've got more. See how that works? It's not just one continuous thick filament all the way from end to end. The thin filaments, see, they stop here. See what I'm talking about? And it's the overlapping of these filaments that make this pattern, this, this arrangement that you can see, the pattern of stripes or striations. So if we take a, a little section of this and, and make a cartoon out of it, blow it up so we can actually see the individual myofilaments, you notice that you've got a place here where you've got two filaments overlapping you got the thick one overlapping with the thin one. And that's what's going to give you the, this one. In fact, from here to here is going to give you this wide, dark band. And then this little squiggly thing here is the little skinny, dark band. Can you all see that? If you squint your eyeballs and turn your head sideways. So, what you have is from one end of the dark, excuse me, from one end of the thick filament to the other end of the thick filament is called the A-band. Now, in the middle of the thick filament is something called an M-line. Now, you can't see that on a light microscope. You have to use an electron microscope to see that M-line. But if you could see it, it would be right in the middle here. This whole thing is the A-band. The M-line would be right in the middle of that big, thick, dark band. Now, the H zone, we're still talking about the A band, okay? So from here to here is the A band. This thing is the M line. There's an area right around the M line where all you have are thick filaments. See, there's no overlapping. The thick one here, the thick and the thin overlap. Here they don't. That's called the H zone. And then at each end, of the entire A-band, you have a zone of overlap where thin filaments and thick filaments overlap. So, you find the thick filaments from one end of the thick filament all the way to the other end of the thick filament is the A-band. At each end of the A-band is a zone of overlap. In the middle of the A-band is the H-zone where all you have are thick filaments and in the middle of the H zone, you have the thing that goes perpendicular called the M line. Okay, now back to the big picture. Here to here 
here is the A band, right? Between the A bands, till you get to the next A band, you have the I band. So basically, you'd have A, I, A, I, A, I, A, I, all the way down. So here's a thick dark band, that's A. Here's a thin lighter or a thick lighter band, that's I. And I don't know, there's a little skinny thing in the middle of that, right? The little skinny thing in the middle of the I band, the whole thing's the I band, the little skinny thing is this little thing's called the Z line or Z disc. Now, what the Z line is made out of is a protein called actinin because the thick myofilaments are made out of what? Myosin, right? Okay. The, the thin myofilaments are made out of actin. The squiggly ones are made out of titin, titan, and then this thing that goes this way, the Z-line is made out of actinin. Basically, the titan goes from Z-line all the way through to the next Z-line. The, the titan is under, is the, the thick filament is basically, the titan goes through in the middle of the thick filament and connects it to, to the Z lines or Z discs. It's called a Z disc because really, I mean, this is it's a it's a circular thing, a tubular thing, right? A cylindrical thing. And so, if you if you took this and turned it this way, you'd see a disc. If you're looking at it this way, it looks like a zig uh, a zag line, zigzag line. A Z line or Z disc, either either term is fine. Now, from Z to Z is what's called a sarcomere. So, muscle from here to here, fascicle from here to here. Fiber from here to here. Myofibril from here to here. Okay? And then the myofibril is sarcomeric to sarcomeric to sarcomeric to sarcomeric to sarcomeric. It's like if the myofibril is a hot dog and you cut up little pieces to give to your two year old, each little piece is a sarcomere. Okay, so here's the electron micrograph. Alright, so let's see. From here to, it's got cut off, but this would be the what? Number one would be the I band, right? Number one's the I band. So number two, from here to here, is the A band. It's darker. Remember, that's where those thick filaments are. All right? This would be the what? Z line. Z -line. This would be the H zone. This would be the zone of overlap. There's another one right here, right? This thing that's right in the middle of the H zone is the M line. And the whole thing from Z to Z is a sarcomere. So basically, you can take a skeletal muscle fiber, the whole cell, and it's basically sarcomere, 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 sarcomere. Okay? Because the fiber is made out of myofibrils, and the myofibrils are basically sarcomere after sarcomere after sarcomere after sarcomere. And, and the reason this is important is the sarcomere, sarcomeres that actually contract. Each sarcomere contracts in on itself, and if you get all of these things contracting, then the whole thing contracts. That's what we call the sarcomeres, the, the basic contractile unit of a myofibril. The myofilaments are the pieces of the sarcomere. Because a sarcomere, from here to here, has some thick myofilaments, some thin myofilaments, some tight myofilaments. The myofilaments alternate down the length of the myofibril, each section of the myofibril is a sarcomere. We've got to go one more step smaller. We actually got to look at each individual little hair, each individual little wire, each individual little myofilament. All right, so now let's look at the thin myofilament, the pink ones here. That's these guys right here. Now, the main protein in the thin myofilament was what? Actin, right? Okay. 
Now, if you look at this, if you blow it up, um, all these little balls, those are all molecules of actin. It's like the beads on a necklace, or, or pearls on a necklace. Now, each little ball is called G-actin. I don't know why, globular, I guess. G for globular, it's a little ball. And then when you take the balls and you string them together, and then you, you have a couple of strands where they stress, it's like taking a pearl necklace and closing it and then twisting it on itself, so that you've got two, two strands of pearls twisted around. That whole, the whole strand would be called F-actin, called F-actin. Each little pearl would be a G-actin molecule. All right, now, notice that each little G-actin, each little ball has this little area that's color-coded here in yellow. That's called an active site. I'll tell you what that's for later. But each little ball has an active site. Now, there's a little rod, little thin protein molecule running right down the center. It's basically the pole that the beads are wrapped around. That's called nebulin. If you took your hot glue gun, glue gun and wrapped a ribbon around all of that, the ribbon is tropomyosin. That's this thing. See that? Looks like a little rope or something. And notice that the tropomyosin is covering what? Ah, covering the active sites. The active site, that spot on each little actin molecule, each little globular actin, that active site is like a handle for myosin. It's where myosin can attach to the active. Troponin, the funny looking little sequence here, you've got three parts. One part binds to the tropomyosin. You got that, right? One part binds to the G actin, so it kind of helps hold the tropomyosin on there. And one part binds to the calcium. Calcium is the key to getting muscle cells to contract. No calcium, no contraction. And this is not only true for, it's true for all muscle cells, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. Specifically, we're talking about um, skeletal. The cardiac is almost, there's a few differences I'll point out, but they basically, cardiac muscle cells work the same way. Okay, so that was the thin, the thin mod filament. Let me show you what swings up on the thick myofilament. The thick myofilament is basically this thing here. That's the titan that's going all the way through it. Okay, the little squiggly thing, this thing here. All of this purple stuff is a protein called myosin. The myosin, the thick filaments are made out of a bunch of these myosin molecules all glued together. But a myosin molecule, um, it's kind of like taking two golf clubs and twisting the shafts around them so that you've got the heads of the golf clubs sticking out. And you take about 300 of those and glue them together, glue them to the titan, and you got a thick filament. So the shaft, or the, the two shafts wrapped around each other, would be called a myosin tail. This is the myosin head, and it's actually a double head. It's two, two, like two golf club heads. And you have a little hinge region that allows it to reach up and grab the active. And of course, remember in the middle here, you've got the inline proteins that kind of support the, the middle of the thick filaments. Otherwise, they might sag like my bookcases. Back to the big picture. Skeletal muscle is surrounded by what kind of connective tissue? Epimysium. Epimysium. And it contains segments called fascicles. fascicles. Right. Each fascicle is surrounded by connective tissue called perimysium. perimysium. It contains individual muscle fibers, which is the same thing as a muscle cell. Okay. Each muscle cell is surrounded by endomycium, and it contains myofibrils. Okay? Each myofibril is surrounded by blue bacon, sarcoplasmic reticulum, okay. and of course, the myofibril is divided into the segments called sarcomeres, but the actual little hairs are called filaments. myofilaments, exactly. The sarcomere contains the thick and the thin, and even the tight myofilaments.